is Rock and Roll Grad School with your hosts, Heidi Hedquist and Luke Poling. Why do you build them up, Buttercup? Hello, kitties. We're going to have a good time together. We've got Roger Street Freeman on the show today, singer songwriter. And I feel like I need to come clean as professional as we keep this show. And you yes. know this. Mm. I forgot to hit record at the start of the interview. You did. I did. So we kind of come in a couple minutes late. Oh, you need to know that Roger has a new record that is called Love, Hope, Trust. It is available now. And it was produced and a couple of songs were co-written uh, and they was played on by Larry Campbell, who has played with Levon Helm, Bob Dylan and others. Mm -hmm. And I think that's about it. Uh, that's a lot. I know. So it's interesting. I was looking back over the last year and how quickly time changes the number of shows I've gone to see in the past 12 months in the past year mm -hmm. it's just been a uh it's been an embarrassment of riches and I don't know I if know. I have have a favorite show that I've seen do you have one that this year that really stood out to you I had several um and you, you can answer what they are <laughs> well I, I'm contemplating I mean I think the I think the festival in Kentucky was my favorite bourbon bourbon and beyond beyond yes um because i had never seen pearl jam and just being able to see neil finn and liam finn and to see neil finn with eddie vetter i think that was a benchmark mm. moment sure. sparks was also a benchmark moment definitely um and the stones really early in the year although i'd seen oh, them before right. was pretty awesome yeah but I then think so. there are a million others that i would probably add it was yeah. just a very good year of shows because a lot of people were out that hadn't been out even for several years prior to COVID. And when was Elton? I think I saw Elton this year too. I, I don't want to answer yeah. this. No, there's, there's a lot. he'd be at the top too. Yeah, there's a lot. Um, yeah. And I feel like all of them, I think there's just an overall sense of we get to leave the house. True. That made every for show now. a lot of fun for now. Um, I'm trying to just stay positive. Now, well, negative, pause, trying to stay upbeat. Um, yes. And, but I feel like everything from Sparks, just for to see them in person, I felt like the entire audience was just ecstatic. But from seeing the, the darkness and a uh, friend of the show, the Dead Deads, to mm -hmm. X, to, or oh, sorry, friend of the show, X, to friend of the show, Roxy Music, everybody mm -hmm. just had a sense of, we get to be together again. And I think it, if nothing else, the takeaway is that it highlighted the joy with which music can bring us all together. It's true. It's the one thing that can, I think. I know, yeah. I don't even think chocolate can do it. I think it's only music. Mm, yeah, good point. Let's go back to the beginning. Time to pay some rent All this time we've been moving Hard to believe where we went Trouble hearts and spinning wheels Trouble blowing out from them The butterflies in my stomach uh, I did, and then I heard nothing. It was like radio silence for about six months. Um, and I thought, okay, well, that's that. Um, he hated it but that but then you know larry's a very busy guy as i've come to learn yeah um i i think he may be the hardest working person in show business <laughs> but um he he sent me an email saying um i got a, finally got a chance to listen to this stuff i'm really really impressed and i'd, I'd love to work together if, if we can work it out you know and uh and that that was rise uh, the 2020 album it's almost more of a credit to you that it did take that long, I feel, because that means you were constantly in the back of his mind, like he wasn't going to let it go until the time was right and when he could give the time and attention to it. And then it's almost better, I feel, though probably very stressful at the time and frustrating, <laughs> but. <laughs> uh, you know, it's, it's, it's so long ago, actually, like I, it's not that long ago, but, um, 
I hadn't thought of it that way, but I think that is a good way to think of it. Yeah. Um, and I did have the thought, you know, he, he, you know, it's the devil on one shoulder and the angel on the course. other. Oh, no, he hated it, you know, because of course, <laughs> right. like every uh, artist or person or human being, I have tons and tons of self-doubt. And on the other shoulder, you know, the, the angel saying he just hasn't had time to listen to it yet, you know, <laughs> whatever. But, right. Um, you know, just, but when that email came through, it was just an incredible, you know, like, such an affirmation, you know, yeah. um, from, from a guy like that, you know, and, and, you know, there's, he, he, there's no errors about Larry Campbell, you know, he's, he is, who he, is, you know, right. he, he says what he thinks and he's, um, uh, you know, he's very kind and, um, but he's not, he's not going to say that if he doesn't mean it. Right. Right. And so this was, that was the, your record previous to this new one, correct? Is that what we're yeah. saying? Yeah, that was Rise in 2020. And then, uh, and we had just, you know, we had a great time recording that album, actually. And I, um, I, my, my, you know, I can't say enough about working with him just because, you know, from, um, there's all kinds of producers and and some producers are very much um let the band do their thing and then i'll make a suggestion here or there you know and it's very big picture hands off until the critical moment you know like in the song like we have to you know, we have to give it a little more there or take a little way there or break it down here um but larry's always thinking about how everything fits together at all times and mm -hmm. not to say that he's not letting the band and, and me, you know, have freedom in the process and, and input. Um, but the wheels are always turning, you know, and then I think he's always thinking about what he's going to, you know, what he's going to layer in on top of the basic tracks and, um, and his arrangement ideas are always, you know, just really You know, I guess there are many ways to skin a cat, but whenever he says, well, why don't we move this verse over here and this chorus over here or whatever, <laughs> it's always like, oh, shit, why didn't I think of that? I, right. <laughs> like, oh, yeah, huh. <laughs> well, and the interesting thing, too, is, I mean, you were saying, you know, he comes in and does a session on the first record, 10 hours. Um, that's like a first date. When someone's producing your record, you guys are moving in together. Yes, this is a it's a different relationship. It's a lot of trust. And it, it's so interesting. Um, again, you hear things about producers, especially producers who have a name, in some way, shape or form of having certain ways of working. And I don't do this. And like you said, they, he doesn't sit back, he just came in it. Did you ever stump him on any instrument where you're like, can you play this? Because I've, I don't know how many times I've seen him play. And every time it's like, he just picks up whatever and goes to town on this thing. He's unstumpable. <laughs> <laughs> uh, in fact, he's given me some homework uh, in the when, when uh, uh, he stayed over one one night and the next morning we were uh, just noodle, noodling around on the guitar and I was uh, I guess I'm always uh, on the on the title track to this album love hope trust he's playing the strat you know and he's got these great lines that he's playing and it's i'm like where does that come from you know what's the vernacular that you're drawing on you know what because it's and of course it's a bunch of them all amalgamated into larry campbell but right but he said you know if you want to start somewhere start with this guy jerry reed who's just this great you know mm -hmm. yeah guitar player so uh so he gave me some homework so i'm working on some jerry reed tunes now um and it's miraculous that anybody could play the, the stuff that he played and of course larry can play it like he just says do this blah, blah, blah. you know it's, and um but i highly recommend checking out jerry reed to any listeners out there if uh, who are into guitar players and playing because he's amazing he played with chet atkins um did, did you know just one of the all-time greats. Um, but no, I've never been able to stump Larry. It's fascinating. And I've so, 
I'm also. Blow- I mean, I'm sorry. I could. No, talk please, about- please, no, please. <laughs> People are tired of hearing us. Yeah, no one wants to hear us. <laughs> oh, that's not true. Yeah. You guys have sound great and ask great questions. I've, uh, I'm really impressed with what I've heard. Um, the uh, every time he picks up an instrument to go like do his thing. It just, it's almost like the, the, the ideas come out fully formed, you know, like he's, it's, it's, and I'm like, it's just so musical and it's almost like a, a magical power that he has to, to make something just fit. It's the perfect line. It's not flashy necessarily, but it's so musical, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, so, and on any int- on any instrument, and all the instruments he plays, he doesn't play them like a guitar player. You know, he plays a, f- a fiddle like a fiddle player. And the mm-hmm. fiddle, the fiddle That's player. the biggest key, right? Yeah. yeah. Anyone can technically pick. Not anyone. There are some very <laughs> talented people that can pick something up and play it, but to play it with the soul of the of the instrument exactly. is a whole different thing. Exactly. Yeah. Now this is your fourth record since you're sort of hiatus from music yeah. which i don't 25 years is that a hiatus is that what you call <laughs> sure. that I think break so. vacation i don't know <laughs> That's um a question there may be another word for it yeah. <laughs> but but yeah sabbatical that sounds yeah. sabbatical i like <laughs> but four records in how has your songwriting changed on this new one And how has it sort of evolved? Do you go into the studio now with stuff fully laid out? Or do you know, I'm going to leave space so we can kind of grow these things and get the... Because again, not just Larry Campbell. You have some other really great musicians playing on this record. Yeah. I mean, the songs are pretty much written Mm -hmm. into the studio. Uh, The first part of the question, I mean, I just think with any doing anything repetitively over and over again and spending enough time on it, you grow and change and evolve. And I think I've gotten better as a songwriter um, in terms of being able to say something um, with, 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 with maybe with less words. I don't know. I, I still write a lot of words, but <laughs> mm-hmm. um there may be better uh, analogies and, and metaphors and, and, uh, and similes and all that. Um, and also, um, I think the writing on this record, I mean, I think there's some really, it's gotten to another level. And I, I think that's just time put in, you know, the whole 10,000 hour thing, hmm. uh, you know, and, ta- and tackling some really difficult subject matter, you know, like uh, there's a song called The Ghosts of Sugar Land on this record that's about convict leasing after the Civil War. And it's, you know, I'm fairly certain it's going to be banned in Florida and Texas. Well, uh, here's hoping. Well, you know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Oops. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, telling stories in a way that keeps it compelling and interesting and, and, and really and truthful. So, uh so I think the songwriting has evolved. And then in terms of coming into the studio, I mean, the songs are pretty much written. Um, and the way Larry and I have been doing it is I'll send him, I, I he had like 30 songs and then he picks the ones that he, he lobbies for the ones that he wants to be mm-hmm. on it. And I'll say, Oh, I agree with that. But I, how about this one too? You know? And, um, and what happens from there is when we all, we don't come in necessarily with an arrangement idea. So we just have the demo and, um, and then we'll come in here with the band and sit down in the studio and just play through the tune. And then I think ideas will evolve from there. Like, and, and then, uh, most of the time the song remains pretty much where it is, but sometimes it goes in a radically different direction. Uh, and that's, you know, based on everybody's input and or and or Larry will have a, uh, you know, there was there's a song called Vapor in the Air that I wrote kind of as a real acoustic singer songwriter kind of a vibe. And it turned into a Latin groove kind of a thing. And that was all Larry and, and we loved it. And and uh, so I hope I answered that question. For sure. Yeah, no, definitely. When you had that epiphany to come back to it, 
all those years ago. Did you think you'd be coming back to it this full force? Or did you think, you know, I just got to get back into it a little bit, a little bit here, a little bit there? Well, I think, um, no, definitely not. I think my first goal um, was to make a record that sort of cataloged some of my older songs and 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 also to have something to leave for my daughter you know we didn't and my son wasn't born at the time um you know and and there was a lot of so it was i don't want to call it a vanity project but it was a vanity project you know it was like let's get this music down in a form that i could be proud of um because i grew up in the studio and i you know um I wasn't happy with the quality of any of my own demos in my basement. I didn't have the right gear and all of that stuff. So I really wanted to make something that was fully formed um, to have for posterity. So that was the first record. And then it got like played on the radio and stuff. And I was like, oh, well, <laughs> look at that. You know, maybe. twist my arm if, yeah. <laughs> then, um, and then the second, you know, was, was really proud of the second record. Um, and I think it was after that that I really was able to focus a lot more on writing and, and spending a lot more time doing this. And uh, um, glad you can edit out the pauses. Yeah. <laughs> oh no, there's <laughs> yeah. We're adding extra pauses. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I, 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 that's when it. When, it, when I really started to be able to um, learn about myself and about myself as a writer and how to follow that thread when it came and, and, and really go deeper and, um, you know, and, you know, I think because I, as a writer, I really, all of my, all of my favorite writers just, you know, they go right for the jugular, you know, like, yeah. Beating around the bush in a in a Joni Mitchell song, you know, or a Paul Simon song, or a Jackson Brown song. So I, um, and that's a pro working to where you're not afraid to say what you really need to say is a pr is hard, mm -hmm. you know, because you know you don't want to offend people who might see themselves in that line. They have a very personal song, you know, so. Um, but that's when I think it really started to click that I was, I really started to feel like an artist and not just a guy that had come back to it and was making some records, you know, mm -hmm. and, um, that was an epiphany. And then, and then, uh, working on Rise with Larry, um, was another level deeper and, uh, you know, uh, uh, another, um, confidence builder in terms of myself as a as a writer and a singer and a songwriter i said writer twice there sorry well you know it's an important part of the process yeah. yeah um so on the new record and like you said as you've sort of evolved and grown as a as a writer and as an artist these this new batch of songs do you think these are things that you wrote for yourself or do you think you wrote them for other people because when you're writing about slavery and you're you know doing stuff that is going to either stir up people one way or the other who who is that for well i think i write everything for myself mm -hmm. and to, to, uh, with the hope that it'll resonate with other people you know uh there's um i'm a, i'm an i'm like a news junkie and i'm especially now because you know every other day i worry that the world is going to come to an end <laughs> yeah that's so. always that possibility yeah <laughs> so um and i'm i'm i think i'm moved by a lot of what i read and i'm all you know like in the in the case of uh like convict leasing i was pissed off that i'd never learned about it in school you know i was like well why don't they teach this you know and obviously there's i guess there's obvious reasons why nobody wants to look at it really mm -hmm. uh, in depth but um so for me, it was a way to teach myself the story and also, you know, I, I, I was excited about that song because it was like a 
I always I, I felt like it was my stab at a, a song like the Edmund Fitz the wreck of the Edmund Fitzgerald, mm -hmm. you know, one of those old folk songs that. Um, uh, so it was kind of like for myself, like skill building, and then also a little history lesson. And you know, yeah, I hope people gravitate towards it. Actually, I sang it in Philly the other night. And when I got to one of the lines, the whole crowd erupted in like you know shrieks. Wow. I think I I touched a nerve with, with um, some old folkies. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, in the so this record you've you wrote it over the past few years, so how, I was gonna I'm trying to think of a way to phrase this, but um, it, are a lot of the songs sort of allegorical, metaphorical, or are they sort of all harsh? Sort of this is what happened, and depending on which one, is that because you could or could not find enough rhymes for the word pandemic? <laughs> Um, yeah, not much comes to mind. And yeah, uh, it's really, they all ended, you know, you got your epidemic, but that's still the same thing, really. Right. It's a half rhyme. Right, right. I can't know. Yeah. Yeah, that was definitely part of the problem. Uh, there are definitely <laughs> allegorical songs on there. There's a, um, there's a song called Cut Your Losses, which is, uh, uh, on the surface about an old Victorian house that was built before the Civil War that's kind of falling down and uh, uh, but it's sort of a metaphor for my perception of the GOP. Mm. Um, not to get too political, I mean, but that's no. uh, yeah, I see I see where that's going. Um, I get it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> not a political show. We always caveat we are not a political show. But oh, makes yeah. makes sense. Makes yeah. sense. Um, there were more, you know. So I, I think it was all most of the writing on this was just like from the perspective of a person living in the world with everything that's going on, and like a person who has a family. And there's so there's songs about you know that were uh, inspired by my family, like uh, "Multiply by Two was about my one of my kids. We were sitting around the 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 fireplace in the living room on, on a very, very cold night in the winter. And um, maybe it was during the pandemic, even I can't exactly remember. And my son, who's younger than my daughter said, ask me who I love more. Fair question. <laughs> Him or his sister. And uh, I said, definitely you. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, you know, we were talking a minute ago. I was like, yeah, I bet there have been some times where those two or are in an argument and your daughter's like he's written way more songs about me <laughs> and it's the first one was about me that's right <laughs> now they're all about both of them um, uh, so got like, now i have to share <laughs> <laughs> um, and then and songs you know so that's a pretty there's a song where multiplied by two it's a pretty romantic uh sweet song about the two of them and then there's a another song called i want her to know which was written um after having kind of like a screaming match with my teenage daughter <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> and uh so there's that and then you know love hope trust is really about how no one's talking to each other anymore and you know uh we're all just scared you know it's, it's like fear 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 and um you know how do we get past that and uh um, annabelle is about human trafficking you know sex trafficking was another story that i'd heard on the news about mm -hmm. a girl who who was tricked by her boy her quote-unquote boyfriend into coming up to san diego and you know basically sold into slavery mm -hmm. um so yeah i mean um i lost the original question but i think i think it's both mm -hmm. yeah. allegorical and very specific uh felix sadly my, the, the, my, my producer and who became a good friend of mine passed away in 2020 um so there's a song called about you on there which is about him and, um do you know what all these songs are about when you start writing them? No, I. Or do you kind of halfway through go, oh, this is what I think I'm talking about here? Mm 
it works both ways, but it's mostly the second way. Mm -hmm. Um, and, um, a lot of it's because a lot of, for me, the process starts usually with a riff or, or a chord pattern on the guitar. Um, and then, you know, singing nonsense words. And then sometimes that gets recorded into a voice memo. And then later I'll come back to it and say, what was I saying? And I'll find, I'll find a thread there, but I find, uh, coming back to things is not so such a great way for me to work. If I don't finish it, it takes a long time to finish. So if I get something that I'm excited about, I will just sing the nonsense words until a phrase comes in. And then once that phrase comes in, then I'll open up my laptop and it used to be a, I used to write stuff down, but now it's just so much more efficient to do word. And, um, and I'll just start writing the song. And sometimes it's not clear where it's going. And, uh, and I get pleasantly surprised. I was say that's kind of fun, that mysterious journey for yourself. Yeah, and I think I think one of the things that I've really taken to heart and learned how to do is to accept to not get frustrated by the fact that I don't know what this is yet because it sucks mm -hmm. right now. You know, like in the middle there, it's you know, if you can imagine somebody chipping away at a piece of stone. Oh yeah. You know, it doesn't look so great while in the plot in the process you know until, until it starts to get closer to being fully fully done so um i think that was a big lesson for me to learn was to just be patient with the process and uh that's that's i think that's why the songs have gotten to to another level mm -hmm. that makes sense you said larry kind of picked a early track list from the 30 songs is there any ones that he really missed the boat on that you're saving for the next record now just to show him or did he do a pretty good job? Well, I think he did a great job. Um, you know, and, and unfortunately there are some that I, that I wish we could have gotten to, but it would have just been too many songs for one. Right. Um, uh, I've got, uh, one that didn't get on there is called the land of the leaf blower and the mighty suv and, what's that about uh, <laughs> <laughs> about all this annex that gets taken in <laughs> um and but uh I, I think it's a good problem to have you know oh certainly we're, we're all we're, we're we're both looking forward to the next one now um in fact, I'm going to see him next week because I was asked to sing a Hank Williams song for a cover album, uh, mm -hmm. a Hank a compilation that a uh, local label is putting out. So uh, Larry's going to help me put that together too. So I'm excited about that. That's, that's amazing. Yeah, that's awesome. So how is the live performance of these going over? You happy with the reception? I mean, if people in Philly are ready to join you in the street i mean that's that's a good sign a yeah. definitely good sign uh it's going great really great um and i did um we did play some of these over the summer too while we were in the process of recording the record so i had a little bit of experience with it um yeah i think people um you know, I, the band has also gotten to a really good spot now, where where um, it's really gelled, and the, and and it's all about putting over the song and making sure that everybody can hear the words, and and uh, yeah, it's been really really positive. No one's awesome. there's there's a um, you know, sometimes there are songs that are lyrically very important and sometimes it's musically very important um like the, the that the that, that the motifs and the and the themes and the figures get played um and that's what makes the total live experience happen and sure. i think we've, we've gotten both of those <laughs> Cash sits in a box on the bedstand. Night falls like the point of a dart. Papa's falling. 
Love, Hope, Trust by Roger Street Freeman is available right now wherever you get your music. For more information and for live dates, check out his website, rogerstreetfreeman.com. You can also find him on Facebook, facebook.com slash rogerstreetfreeman. You can check us out on all the various socials. Be sure to visit our website at rockandrollgradschool.com. And don't forget to leave us a review. Today's show is produced by myself and Heidi Hegquist. Our reluctant producers are John Sauvé and Sandy Stone. Our willing producers are Rachel Allen and Randy Jeanette. Our intern is Zach Jackson. This one's for Philippe. Thank you, good night, and may all your favorite bands stay together. Oh,